Chapter 9 of Buried Alive by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 9. A Glossy Mail. The machine was one of those electric contrivances that do their work noiselessly and efficiently, like a garrota or the guillotine. No odour, no teeth-disturbing grind of rack and pinion, no trumpeting with that machine. It arrived before the gate with such absence of sound that Alice, though she was dusting in the front room, did not hear it. She heard nothing till the bell discreetly tinkled. Justifiably assuming that the tinkler was the butcher's boy, she went to the door with her apron on, and even with the duster in her hand. A handsome, smooth man stood on the step, and the electric carriage made a background for him. He was a dark man with curly black hair and a moustache to match and black eyes. His silk hat, of an incredible smooth newness, glittered over his glittering hair and eyes. His overcoat was lined with astrakhan, and this important fact was casually betrayed at the lapels and at the sleeves. He wore a black silk necktie with a small pearl pin in the mathematical centre of the perfect rhomboid of the upper part of a sailor's knot. His gloves were of slate colour. The chief characteristic of his faintly striped trousers was the crease which seemed more than mortal. His boots were of glacé kid and as smooth as his cheeks. The cheeks had a fresh boyish colour, and between them, over admirable snowy teeth, projected the hooked key to his temperament. It is possible that Alice, from sheer thoughtlessness, shared the vulgar prejudice against Jews, but certainly she did not now feel it. The man's personal charm, his exceeding niceness, had always conquered that prejudice whenever encountered. Moreover, he was only about thirty-five in years, and no such costly and beautiful male had ever yet stood on Alice's doorstep. She at once, in her mind, contrasted him with the curates of the previous week, to the disadvantage of the established church. She did not know that this man was more dangerous than a thousand curates. "'Is this Mr. Leakes?' he inquired smilingly, and raised his hat. "'Yes,' said Alice, with a responsive smile. "'Is he in?' Well, said Alice, he's busy at his work. You see, in this weather he can't go out much, not to work, and so he... Could I see him in his studio? asked the glossy man, with the air of saying, Can you grant me the supreme favour? It was the first time that Alice had heard the attic called a studio. She paused. It's about pictures, exclaimed the visitor. Oh, said Alice, will you come in? I've run down specially to see Mr Leake, said the visitor, with emphasis. Alice's opinion as to the seriousness of her husband's gift for painting had, of course, changed in two years. A man who can make two or three hundred a year by sticking colours anyhow at any hazard on her canvases, by producing alleged pictures that in Alice's secret view bore only a comic resemblance to anything at all, that man had to be taken seriously in his attic as an artisan. It is true that Alice thought the payment he received miraculously high for the quality of the work done. But with this agreeable Jew in the hall and the coupé at the curb, she suddenly perceived the probability of even greater miracles in the matter of price. She saw the average price of ten pounds rising to fifteen or even twenty pounds, provided her husband was given no opportunity to ruin the affair by his absurd retiring shyness. Would you come this way? she suggested briskly. And all that elegance followed her up to the attic door, which door she threw open, remarking simply, Henry, here is a gentleman come to see you about pictures. A connoisseur. Priam recovered more quickly than might have been expected. His first thought was naturally that women are uncalculated, if not incalculable, creatures, and that the best of them will do impossible things, things inconceivable till actually done. Fancy her introducing a stranger without a word of warning direct into his attic. However, when he rose, he saw the visitor's nose whose nostrils were delicately expanding and contracting in the fumes of the oil stove, and he was at once reassured. He knew that he would have to face neither rudeness, nor bluntness, nor lack of imagination, nor lack of quick sympathy. Besides, the visitor, with practical assurance, set the tone of the interview instantly. "'Good morning, Maitre,' he began right off. "'I must apologise for breaking in upon you.' but I've come to see if you have any work to sell. My name is Oxford, and I'm acting for a collector. 
He said this with a very agreeable mingling of sincerity, deference and mercantile directness, also with a bright, admiring smile. He showed no astonishment at the interior of the attic. Maitre. Well, of course it would be idle to pretend that the greatest artists do not enjoy being addressed as maitre. Master is the same word, but entirely different. It was a long time since Priam Fowl had been called maitre. Indeed, owing to his retiring habit, he had very seldom been called maitre at all. A just-finished picture stood on an easel near the window. It represented one of the most wonderful scenes in London. Putney High Street at night. Two omnibus horses stepped strongly and willingly out of a dark side street, and, under the cold glare of the main road, they somehow took on the quality of equestrian sculpture. The alternation of lights was in the highest degree complex. Priam understood immediately, from the man's calm glance at the picture, and the position which he instinctively took up to see it, that he was accustomed to looking at pictures. The visitor did not start back, nor rush forward, nor dissolve into hysterics, nor behave as though confronted by the ghost of a murdered victim. He just gazed at the picture, keeping his nerve and holding his tongue. And yet it was not an easy picture to look at. It was a picture of an advanced experimentalism, and would have appealed to nothing but the sense of humour in a person not a connoisseur. Sell? exclaimed Priam. Like all shy men, he could hide his shyness in an exaggerated familiarity. What price this? And he pointed to the picture. There were no other preliminaries. It is excessively distinguished, murmured Mr. Oxford in the accents of ex expert appreciation. Excessively distinguished. May I ask how much? That's what I'm asking you, said Priam, fiddling with a paint rag. Hmm, observed Mr. Oxford and gazed in silence. Then, 250? Priam had virtually promised to deliver that picture to the picture framer on the next day, and he had not expected to, to receive a penny more than twelve pounds for it. But artists are strange organisms. He shook his head. Although two hundred and fifty pounds was as much as he had earned in the previous twelve months, he shook his grey head. No, said Mr Oxford kindly and respectfully, putting his hands behind his back. By the way, he turned with eagerness to Priam, I presume you have seen the portrait of Ariosto by Titian that they have bought for the National Gallery? What is your opinion of it, Maitre? He stood expectant, glowing with interest. Except that it isn't Ariosto, and it certainly isn't by Titian. It's a pretty high-class sort of thing, said Priam. Mr Oxford smiled with appreciative content, nodding his head. I hoped you would say so, he remarked. And swiftly he passed on to Segantini, then to J. W. Morris, and then to Bonnard, demanding the matron's views. In a few moments they were really discussing pictures, and it was years since Priam had listened to the voice of informed common sense on the subject of painting. It was years since he had heard anything but exceeding puerility concerning pictures. He had, in fact, accustomed himself not to listen. He had excavated a passage direct from one ear to the other for such remarks. And now he drank up the conversation of Mr. Oxford and perceived that he had long been thirsty. And he spoke his mind. He grew warmer, more enthusiastic, more impassioned. And Mr. Oxford listened with ecstasy. Mr. Oxford had apparently a natural discretion. He simply accepted Priam, as he stood, for a great painter. No reference to the enigma why a great painter should be painting in an attic in Werter Road, Putney. No inconvenient queries about the great painter's previous history and productions. Just the frank, full acceptance of his genius. It was odd, but it was comfortable. So you won't take 250? asked Mr. Oxford, hopping back to business. No, said Priam sturdily. The truth is, he added, I should rather like to keep that picture for myself. Would you take 500, Maitre? Yes, I suppose I will, and Priam sighed, a genuine sigh, for he would really have liked to keep the picture. He knew he had never painted a better. And may I carry it away with me? asked Mr. Oxford. I expect so, said Priam. I wonder if I might venture to ask you to come back to town with me, Mr. Oxford went on in gentle deference. I have one or two pictures I should very much like you to see, and I fancy they might give you pleasure. 
and we could talk over future business, if possibly you could spare an hour or so, if I might request. A desire arose in Priam's breast and fought against his timidity. The tone in which Mr Oxford had said, I fancy they might give you pleasure, appeared to indicate something very much out of the common. And Priam could scarcely recollect when last his eyes had rested on a picture that was at once unfamiliar and great. Parfit's Galleries I have already indicated that the machine was somewhat out of the ordinary. It was, as a fact, exceedingly out of the ordinary. It was much larger than electric carriages usually are. It had what the writers of motoring notes in papers written by the wealthy for the wealthy loved to call a limousine body. And outside and in it was miraculously new and spotless. On the ivory handles of its doors, on its soft yellow leather upholstery, on its cedar woodwork, on its patent blind apparatus, on its silver fittings, on its lamps, on its footstools, on its silken arm slings, not the minutest trace of usage. Mr Oxford's car seemed to show that Mr Oxford never used a car twice, purchasing a new car every morning, like stockbrokers their silk hats or the Duke of Selsey his trousers. There was a table in the body for writing and pockets up and down devised to hold documents, also two armchairs and a suspended contrivance which showed the hour, the temperature and the fluctuations of the barometer. There was also a speaking tube. One felt that if the machine had been connected by wireless telegraphy with the stock exchange, the leading studios and the Houses of Parliament, and if a little restaurant had been constructed in the rear, Mr Oxford might never have been under the necessity of leaving the car, that he might have passed all his days in it from morn till latest eve. The perfection of the machine, and of Mr Oxford's attire and complexion, caused Priam to look rather shabby. Indeed, he was rather shabby. Shabbiness had slightly overtaken him in Putney. Once he had been a dandy, but that was in the lamented Leek's time. And as the car glided, without smell and without noise, through the encumbered avenues of London towards the centre, now shooting forward like a star, now stopping with gentle suddenness, now swerving in a swift curve round a vehicle earthy and leaden-wheeled, Priam grew more and more uncomfortable. He had sunk into a groove at Putney. He never left Putney, save occasionally to refresh himself at the National Gallery, and thither he invariably went by train and tube, because the tube always filled him with wonder and romance, and always threw him up out of the earth at the corner of Trafalgar Square with such a strange exhilaration to his soul, so that he had not seen the main avenues of London for a long time. He had been forgetting riches and luxury and the oriental cigarette shops whose proprietors' names ended in Opolos, and the haughtiness of the ruling classes, and the still sterner haughtiness of their footmen. He had now abandoned Alice in Putney, and a mysterious demon seized him and gripped him and sought to pull him back in the direction of the simplicity of Putney, and struggled with him fiercely and made him writhe and shrink before the brilliant phenomena of London centre, and indeed almost pitched him out of the car and set him running as hard as legs would carry to Putney. It was the demon which he called Habit. He would have given a picture to be in Putney, instead of swimming past Hyde Park Corner to the accompaniment of Mr Oxford's amiable and deferential and tactful conversation. However, his other demon, Shyness, kept him from imperiously stopping the car. The car stopped itself in Bond Street in front of a building with a wide archway and the symbol of empire floating largely over its roof. Placard said that admission through the archway was a shilling, but Mr Oxford, bearing Priam's latest picture as though it had cost fifty thousand instead of five hundred pounds, went straight into the place without paying, and Priam accepted his impressive invitation to follow. Aged military veterans, whose breasts carried a row of medals, saluted Mr Oxford as he entered, and within a penetralia, beings in silk hats as faultless as Mr Oxford's raised those hats to Mr Oxford, who did not raise his in reply, merely nodded, Napoleonically. His demeanour had greatly changed. You saw here the man of unbending will, accustomed to use men as pawns in the chess of a complicated career. Presently they reached a private office, where Mr Oxford, with the assistance of a page, removed his gloves, furs and hat, and sent sharply for a man who once brought a frame which fitted Priam's picture. Do you have a cigar? 
Mr. Oxford urged Priam, with a quick return to his earlier manner, offering a box in which each cigar was separately encased in gold leaf. The cigar was such as costs a crown in a restaurant, half a crown in a shop, and tuppence in Amsterdam. It was a princely cigar, with the odour of paradise and an ash as white as snow. But Priam could not appreciate it. No. He'd seen on a beaten copper place under the archway these words, Parfit's Galleries. He was in the celebrated galleries of his former dealers, whom, by the way, he had never seen. And he was afraid. He was mortally apprehensive and had a sickly sensation in the stomach. After they had scrupulously inspected the picture through the clouds of incense, Mr Oxford wrote out a cheque for £500 and, cigar in mouth, handed it to Priam, who tried to take it with a casual air and did not succeed. It was signed, Parfitts. I dare say you've heard that I'm now the sole proprietor of this place, said Mr Oxford through his cigar. Really, said Priam, feeling just as nervous as an inexperienced youth. Then Mr Oxford led Priam over thick carpets to a saloon where electric light was thrown by means of reflectors onto a small but incomparable band of pictures. Mr Oxford had not exaggerated. They did give pleasure to Priam. They were not the pictures one sees every day, nor once a year. There was the finest Delacroix of its size that Priam had ever met with. Also a Vermeer that made it unnecessary to visit the Rijksmuseum. And on the more distant wall to which Mr Oxford came last, in a place of marked honour, was an evening landscape of Volterra, a hill town in Italy. The bolts of Priam's very soul started when he caught sight of that picture. On the lower edge of the rich frame were two words in black lettering, Priam Fahl. How well he remembered painting it, and how masterfully beautiful it was. Now that, said Mr Oxford, is in my humble opinion one of the finest fowls in existence. What do you think, Mr Leake? Priam paused. I agree with you, said he. Fowl, said Mr Oxford, is about the only modern painter that can stand the company that that picture has in this room, eh? Priam blushed. Yes, he said. There is a considerable difference in various matters between Putney and Volterra. But the picture of Volterra and the picture of Putney High Street were obviously, strikingly, incontestably, by the same hand. One could not but perceive the same brushwork, the same masses, the same manner of seeing and of grasping. In a word, the same dazzling and austere transition of nature. The resemblance jumped at one and shook one by the shoulders. It could not have escaped even an auctioneer. Yet Mr Oxford did not refer to it. He seemed quite blind to it. All he said was, as they left the room and Priam finished his rather monosyllabic praise, Yes, that's a little collection I've just got together, and I'm very proud to have shown it to you. Now, I want you to come and have lunch with me at my club, but please do. I should be desolated if you refused. Priam did not care a halfpenny about the desolation of Mr Oxford, and he most sincerely objected to lunch at Mr Oxford's club. But he said, yes because it was the easiest thing for his shyness to do, Mr Oxford being a determined man. Priam was afraid to go. He was disturbed, alarmed, affrighted by the mystery of Mr Oxford's silence. They arrived at the club in the car. The club. Priam had never been in a club before. The statement may astonish, may even meet with incredulity, but it is true. He had left the land of clubs early in life. As for the English clubs in European towns, he was familiar with their exteriors and with the amiable babble of their supporters at Tables d'Hôte, and his desire for further knowledge had not been so hot as to inconvenience him. Hence, he knew nothing of clubs. Mr Oxford's club alarmed and intimidated him. It was so big and so black. Externally, it resembled a town hall of some great industrial town. As you stood on the pavement at the bottom of the flight of giant steps that led to the first pair of swinging doors, your head was certainly lower than the feet of a being who examined you sternly from the other side of the glass. Your head was also far below the sills of the mighty windows of the ground floor. There were two storeys above the ground floor, 
and above them a projecting eave of carven stone that threatened the uplifted eye like a menace. The tenth part of a slate, the merest chip of a corner, falling from the lofty summit of that pile, would have slain elephants. And all the facade was black, black with ages of carbonic deposit. The notion that the building was a town hall that had got itself misplaced and perverted gradually left you as you gazed. You perceived its falseness. You perceived that Mr Oxford's club was a monument, a relic of the days when there were giants on earth, that it had come down unimpaired to a race of pygmies who were making the best of it. The sole descendant of the giants was the scout behind the door. As Mr Oxford and Priam climbed towards it, this unique giant, with a giant's force, pulled open the gigantic door, and Mr Oxford and Priam walked imperceptibly in, and the door swung to with a large displacement of air. Priam found himself in an immense interior under a distant carved ceiling far, far upwards, like heaven. He watched Mr Oxford write his name in a gigantic folio under a gigantic clock. This accomplished, Mr Oxford led him past enormous vistas to right and left into a very long chamber, both of whose long walls were studded with thousands upon thousands of massive hooks and here and there upon a hook a silk hat or an overcoat. Mr Oxford chose a couple of hooks in the expanse, and when they had divested themselves sufficiently, he led Priam forwards into another great chamber, evidently meant to recall the bars of Caracalla. In gigantic basins chiselled out of solid granite, Priam scrubbed his fingernails with a nail brush larger than he had previously encountered even in nightmares, and an attendant brushed his coat with a utensil that resembled a weapon of offence, lately the property of Anak. Shall we go straight to the dining room now? asked Mr Oxford. Or will you have a gin and angostura first? Priam declined the gin and angostura, and they went up an overwhelming staircase of sombre marble and through other apartments to the dining room, which would have made an excellent riding school. Here one had six of the gigantic windows in a row, each with curtains that fell in huge folds from the unseen into the scene. The ceiling probably existed. On every wall were gigantic paintings in thick, ornate frames, and between the windows stood heroic busts of marble set upon columns of basalt. The chairs would have been immovable had they not run on casters of weight-resisting rock, yet against the tables they had the air of negligible toys. At one end of the room was a sideboard, that would not have groaned under an ox hole, and at the other a fire, over which an ox might have been roasted in its entirety, leaped under a mantelpiece upon which Goliath could not have put his elbows. All was silent and grave. The floors were everywhere covered with heavy carpets which hushed all echoes. There was not the faintest sound. Sound, indeed, seemed to be deprecated. Priam had already passed the wide entrance to one illimitable room whose walls were clothed with warnings in gigantic letters. Silence! And he noticed that all chairs and couches were thickly padded and upholstered in soft leather, and that it was impossible to produce in them the slightest creak. At a casual glance the place seemed unoccupied. But on more careful inspection you saw midgets creeping about, or seated in easy chairs that had obviously been made to hold two of them. These midgets were the members of the club, dwarfed into dolls by its tremendous dimensions. A strange and sinister race. They looked as though in the final stages of decay, and wherever their heads might rest was stretched a white cloth, so that their heads might not touch the spots sanctified by the heads of the mighty departed. They rarely spoke to one another, but exchanged regards of mutual distrust and scorn, and if by chance they did converse, it was in tones of weary, brusque disillusion. They could best describe each other, but indistinctly, in the universal pervading gloom, a gloom upon which electric lamps, shining dimly yellow in their vast lustres, produced almost no impression. The whole establishment was buried in the past, dreaming of its titanic yore, when there were doubtless giants who could fill those fauteuils and stick their feet on those mantelpieces. It was in such an environment that Mr Oxford gave Priam to eat and to drink off little ordinary plates and out of tiny tumblers. No hint of the club's immemorial history in that excessively modern and excellent repast, save in the Stilton cheese, 
which seemed to have descended from the fine fruity days of some Homeric age, a cheese that Ulysses might have inaugurated. I need hardly say that the total effect on Priam's temperament was disastrous. Yet how could the diplomatic Mr Oxford have guessed that Priam had never been in a club before? It induced in him a speechless anguish, and he would have paid a sum as gigantic as the club. He would have paid the very cheque in his pocket never to have met Mr Oxford. He was a far too sensitive man for a club, and his moods were incalculable. Assuredly, Mr Oxford had miscalculated the result of his club on Priam's humour. He soon saw his error. Suppose we take coffee in the smoking room, he said. The popular smoking room was the one part of the club where talking with a natural loudness was not a crime. Mr Oxford found a corner fairly free from midgets, and they established themselves in it, and liqueurs and cigars accompanied the coffee. You could actually see midgets laughing outright in the mist of smoke. The chatter narrowly escaped being a din, and at intervals a diminutive boy entered and bawled the name of a midget at the top of his voice. Priam was suddenly electrified, and Mr Oxford, very alert, noticed the electrification. Mr Oxford drank his coffee somewhat quickly, and then he leaned forward a little over the table, and put his moon-like face nearer to Priam's, and arranged his legs in a truly comfortable position beneath the table, and expelled a large quantity of smoke from his cigar. It was clearly a preliminary to a scene of confidence, the approach to the crisis to which he had for several hours been leading up. Priam's heart trembled. What is your opinion, Maitre? he asked. Of the ultimate value of Fowl's pictures? Priam was in misery. Miss Roxford's manner was deferential, amiable, and expectant. But Priam did not know what to say. He only knew what he would do if he could have found the courage to do it. Run away, recklessly, unceremoniously, out of that club. Um, I, I don't know, said Priam, visibly whitening. Because I've bought a goodish few files in my time, Mr Oxford continued, and I must say I've sold them well. I've only got that one left that I showed you this morning, and I've been wondering whether I should stick to it for a possible further rise or sell it at once. How much can you sell it for? Priam mumbled. I don't mind telling you, said Mr Oxford, that I fancy I could sell it for a couple of thousand. It's rather small, but it's one of the finest in existence. I should sell it, said Priam, scarcely audible. You would? Well, perhaps you're right. It's a question in my mind whether some other painter may not turn up one of these days who would do that sort of thing even better than Fowl did it. I could imagine the possibility of a really clever man coming along and imitating Fowl so well that only people like yourself, Maitre, and perhaps me, could tell the difference. It's just the kind of work that might be brilliantly imitated if the imitator was clever enough, don't you think? But what do you mean? asked Priam, perspiring in his back. Well, said Mr Oxford vaguely, one never knows. The style might be imitated and the market flooded with canvases practically as good as files. Nobody might find it out for quite a long time and then there might be confusion in the public mind, followed by a sharp fall in prices. And the beauty of it is that the public wouldn't really be any the worse. Because an imitation that no one can distinguish from the original is naturally as good as the original. You take me? There's certainly a tremendous chance for a man who could seize it, and that's why I'm inclined to accept your advice and sell my one remaining file. He smiled more and more confidentially. His gaze was charged with a secret meaning. He seemed to be suggesting unspeakable matters to Priam. That bright face wore an expression which such faces wear on such occasions, an expression cheerfully insinuating that, after all, there is no right and no wrong, or at least that many things which the ordinary slave of convention would consider to be wrong are really right. So Priam read the expression. The dirty rascal wants me to manufacture imitations of myself for him, Priam thought full of sudden, hidden anger. He's known all along that there's no difference between what I sold him and the picture he's already had. He wants to suggest that we should come to terms. He's simply been playing a game with me up to now. And he said aloud, 
I don't know that I advise you to do anything. I'm not a dealer, Mr Oxford. He said it in a hostile tone that ought to have silenced Mr Oxford for all ever, but it did not. Mr Oxford curved away like a skater into a new figure and began to expatiate minutely upon the merits of the Volterra picture. He analysed it in so much detail and lauded it with as much justice as though the picture was there before them. Prime was astonished at the man's exactitude. Scoundrel! He knows a thing or two, reflected Prime grimly. You don't think I overpraise it, do you, cher maître? Mr Oxford finished, still smiling. A little, said Prime. If only Prime could have run away. But he couldn't. Mr Oxford had him well in a corner. No chance of freedom. Besides, he was over fifty and stout. Ah, now I was expecting you to say that. Do you mind telling me at what period you painted it? Mr Oxford inquired very blandly, though his hands were clasped in a violent tension that forced the blood from the regions of the knuckle joints. This was the crisis which Mr Oxford had been leading up to. All the time Mr Oxford's teethy smile had concealed a knowledge of Priam's identity. End of chapter 9